Hello there and welcome to the massive online open course known as the Virtual School MOOC, uh, which is subtitled An Introduction to K-12 Online Learning Research. The general purpose of this MOOC is to introduce practitioners to the limited amount of information that we have available to us based on the research into K-12 online learning. Uh, as you'll see throughout the course of the next four weeks, online learning has been around for about two decades now at least in, in North America, and obviously K-12 distance education has been around much longer. But the amount of information that we actually know based upon reliable and valid research is still quite limited, as my colleagues and I will talk about over the next four weeks. My name is Michael Barber, and I'm an Assistant Professor of Instructional Technology at Wayne State University, and I will be your lead facilitator for most of the next four weeks. Uh, obviously, this is a big undertaking, and I wouldn't uh, be able to do it on my own, so I'd like to thank a number of my colleagues who have uh, stepped forward and uh, helped out. Uh, folks like Tom and Rick and Catherine and Matt and Paul are all individuals that are um, highly regarded scholars in their particular area when it comes to K-12 online learning. I'm grateful that they're able to join me on this journey. Uh, we're hoping that this will become an annual thing so that next summer we'll actually have a more developed uh, MOOC that we'll be able to provide you uh, with and uh, maybe have some more individuals involved in it uh, beyond those that have started with this uh, first journey. Uh, so I welcome you. Uh, if uh, you are new to MOOCs, uh, take a look around. Make sure you click on the How It Works link on the main page to give you a sense as to what it is you should be doing. Uh, you'll note that the MOOC starts on the 10th of September and continues until the 7th of October. So for those four weeks, we're going to be doing roughly two topics a week. Um, ideally, you'll go and work through it asynchronously at the pace that we've set. Although obviously being a MOOC, um, you know, the material is there for you to work through at your leisure attention to the first topic in the first item uh, in the MOOC, uh, the notion of classifying online learning. The, the first issue we really want to look at is this notion of how do we define K-12 online learning. Um, throughout the course we're going to have some similar definitions and really K-12 online learning is the term we're going to use as sort of the overview or catch-all term. Um, now if you look at it, uh, there are really four terms or four descriptors that you tend to see used uh, most often, uh, those being virtual schooling or virtual learning, cyber schooling or cyber learning, hybrid learning and blended learning. Um, I've put some definitions on the, the screen there, and those are the ones that are contained in the asynchronous material. Those tend to be traditional definitions, and in all honesty, when you see um, K-12 online learning described in the media, and in all often, in all honesty, described in some of the academic literature, one of the things that you'll note is that these descriptions are often used synonymously. For example, while virtual schooling has historically been used to refer to supplemental manners of online learning, supplemental versions of online learning where students were enrolled in a brick and mortar or face-to-face -face school and taking one or more courses to supplement their offerings uh, in an online format, um, you'll note that virtual school and cyber school often get used interchangeably. In fact, um, the International Association for K-12 Online Learning and their official definitions project basically use these terms as synonyms. Um, basically meaning that the, both of the terms in their mind were the same thing. Um, historically, however, cyber school has tended to refer to the pro students who are engaged in full-time online learning or programs that offered full-time online learning, uh, whereas virtual usually meant supplemental. Similarly, hybrid and blended. Um, again, two terms that you'll see used interchangeably, um, although again, Historically, they have had separate meanings. Um, hybrid referred to face-to-face -face instruction and online instruction occurring within the same course or within the same program, but not occurring at the same time. And probably one of the best examples that I could use of this in terms of a, an illustration, uh, you'll see a lot of graduate programs at the university level where students will come together like on the first Saturday of the semester and they'll spend eight hours in the classroom doing all these, these community building teams building type things, getting to know each other and doing some content and then spending the majority of the rest of the course in an online course essentially. So you start off with that face-to-face -face instruction then move to the online instruction. That would be a good example of a, a hybrid style of learning. Uh, blended learning is similar except for the two of them tend to be occurring at the same time. 
Um, the example I've always heard used, and, and I use it myself, is if you walked into a classroom and you saw a teacher walking around facilitating their students as their students completed um, items and activities that were on the internet, um, that would be a good example of, of blended learning. So you have both the, the subject matter expert, the face-to-face the -face teacher in the room, but the instruction is mainly coming from the online program and the, the teacher is just there to help facilitate that. Um, but again, you know, the inequal definitions use hybrid and blended as the same thing, and in all honesty, a lot of the literature will use them as the same thing. So there are these historical uh, definitions that, um, you know, differentiate between these four terms, and then, um, but having said that, oftentimes you'll have them used interchangeably. Dealing a little bit with more with hybrid and, and, and blended learning, one of the things that um, you'll note is there have been some um, paradigms or models that have been put forth and you'll see from the asynchronous content there the two that are probably most commonly used uh, Alan and Seaman came up with what they called a, a course delivery paradigm where they actually determined whether or not a course was online face-to-face -face, blended or hybrid based upon the percentage of the course that was delivered through an electronic or distance format um, now more recently actually just uh, earlier this past spring um, Heather Stocker and Michael Horn came out with a report that outlined what they had described as four models of blended learning. Um, one of the things that's worth mentioning here is that, in all honesty, the term blended learning and has really become more widely used only in the past two or three years. And there are some, particularly those outside of the United States, that actually question its use. Um, if you think about blended learning being students learning online with a teacher that's pr actually present in the room and you sort of think about when we've seen that before um, this is not a, a new or for that matter an uncommon thing if you go back to the the, the late 80s um, early 90s with the, the development of, of online curriculum webs the the 90s with um, Bernie Dodge's web quests. Many of these activities, curriculum webs and web quests in particular, were designed to take multiple classes, in some cases multiple weeks, where students would come in and the teacher already had or would be using instruction that uh, was provided over the internet and the teacher was mainly there to facilitate the students moving through that online instruction. Um, these were examples of blended learning. So blended learning is not really something that is that new within um, our educational system. The term is relatively new and the tying of the term to online learning um, is very new. It's like I say the last two or three years and there are some that would question whether or not that is done for political reasons as a way of, of increasing the perception or the perceived number of students engaged in online and blended learning as they begin to make a case for whatever particular reforms they are trying to push. Um, you know, but so these are some of the, the ways in which we can look at in terms of describing or defining uh, these various terms. Um, obviously, when we're looking at a virtual school environment, um, in ca the case of a um, virtual school, so a supplemental program, this is kind of the model that we're using. And this is a graphic that was originally created by Nikki Davis when she was at Iowa State as part of the teacher education goes into virtual schooling program. Um, but essentially I mean, what you have here is you, you've got that white area in the middle, that VS class, that virtual school class. So that's your online class there. And the dotted boxes around the sides are different schools. And as you can see, you've got a teacher that may or may not be in a specific school. They are teaching students at a number of different schools, in this case three different schools, um, although the teacher is actually physically at one of those three schools. At the schools where the teacher isn't at, in addition to the students there, you've got you know a facilitator or a proctor or a mediating teacher um, there that's supposed to help the students. This is a teacher um, that's at the school level that isn't necessarily a, t uh, a subject matter expert, but someone who's there to provide for the soft skills. And then obviously you've got folks from the district, you've got IT people, you've got administrators, and then you've got parents that are all helping support that interaction. Um, I don't have a graphic here for a full-time program, largely in part because, in all honesty, the full-time program is very much like what we would expect to see in a traditional school environment, where instead of 
um, you know, all of the teachers are located in a single spot. The administration is all located in a single spot, and that's all in the virtual or the cyber school itself. Um, it's just that instead of the student actually physically going to a school, they just log into their school from home. Um, so the model, if you think about it in terms of how it would look uh, structurally in a chart like this, actually would very, very much look like uh, what we would tend to see with a traditional school. Um, you'll notice that there were a couple of different um, characteristics that were outlined there, or teacher roles that were outlined there. Again, this is building on the work of Nikki Davis while she was at Iowa State, although she's continued working in this area, particularly in that virtual school site facilitator uh, role um, or personnel, that teacher that uh, she has since she's moved to the University of Canterbury in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. But essentially the way she described it was that there were uh, three roles that a virtual school or a cyber school teacher, a K-12 online learning teacher if you will, could use um, or could fall into I should say. Uh, the first was virtual school designer and this was the person that actually designed the asynchronous or static content that you find housed in the learning management system or the course management system. The second was a virtual school teacher and this was the individual that was actually responsible for the direct delivery of the curriculum. So this is our highly qualified subject matter expert um, teacher that would be actually teaching the online students. And then finally you had a virtual school site facilitator, uh, often called a mediating teacher or a mentoring teacher. In the full-time uh, cyber schools they tend to be called a learning coach. But this was that teacher, or that, that adult essentially, that was at the local level, so in the student's actual school, that was there to help them with technical issues, that should have been there to provide some of the support for the soft skills that the students may or may not have, um, you know, such as uh, self-directedness, self-responsibility, time management skills, um, and also a liaison between the online teacher, the online program, and the actual school. Uh, many of the schools that we're talking about, particularly the supplemental ones, don't have the ability to assign grades. That's still done by the school. So the site facilitator was someone who would interact with the teacher and the, the online teacher in the online school just to be able to get you know the grades for the students so they could enter them into the school system. Also responsible for that in loco parentis uh, role. The reason I describe these three roles is because if you notice as we move into weeks two and weeks three, um, the topics are organized around what we know about each of these three positions. So I think in the second topic of week two we'll start off with the virtual school designer and then in week three we'll talk both about the virtual school teacher and the virtual school site facilitator uh, looking at the, what we can take away from the limited amount of research that we have in each of these four areas. As I mentioned off the top, my name is Michael Barber. I'm an assistant professor at Wayne State University. You've got my contact information there if you have any additional questions. Um, and I look forward to interacting with you on Twitter and through your blogs and any other uh, means that you've decided to participate in this MOOC.